<laughs> all right, cool. I think we are all here. So let's get cracking without further ado. Hello, everybody, and welcome. As always, it's Hugh here, and we are here for another webinar. This time, we are going to be looking at security integration with Loxon. So as I'm sure that you all know, Loxon has an absolutely fantastic burglar alarm option built in, ready to go. All you need is some form of sensors, for instance, our present sensor, and you've got a great alarm system. What we're going to look at today is the reasons why you may want to use another alarm that isn't Loxon, and if you are, how you can bring that into Loxon. The particular alarm that we're going to use as an example today is a Texacom Premier Elite. And the reason that we're going to use that is because it's quite an open alarm. I would even maybe give them the credit of calling them the locks on of the alarm world in that you have quite a lot of configuration options on the alarm and you can do quite a lot of clever custom stuff. Their communications is fairly open. And I have personal experience with them because I used to be an alarm installer. So I actually, ah, to a degree, know what I'm doing. So the first question is, why might we want to use a third party alarm? And I think it is important for all of us to understand this aspect first, because there's a lot of misinformation in this part of the world. So when you have a property, whether it be residential or commercial, you might have an interest in having a burglar alarm system. Or your insurance may require you to have a burglar alarm system or may offer you a discount on your premium. And so when burglar alarms are done, the official thing that burglar alarms follow is called a grading system. You have grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. And ungraded, meaning it doesn't meet any of the grading requirements. Now, the locks on alarm is ungraded. This is quite simply because for two main reasons. The first is that the grading documentation, if we want to get really nerdy, is the European certification EN50131. And it hasn't really had a major revision for about 15 years. This means that some of the key things that it talks about on the requirements of a graded alarm would actually mean that we would have to reduce functionality of our system, which is something that we're not willing to do. And secondly, because ours is a system that is based around things like software updates that could, again, impact the alarm feature, we would probably have to have our alarm recertified with every config release. Now, we release config two, maybe three times a year. That is a lot of certification, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money for what we believe is overall not that required. So our alarm is ungraded. Then you move into the graded section, and this is where your professionally installed alarms sit. You have grade one, which to be honest, nobody cares about. Nobody ever does grade one. Grade one is considered like a low risk system. You have grade two, which is considered like a, a medium uh, to medium high risk system. So this would be uh, typically large domestic and small commercial. And then you have grade three, which is high risk. This would be jewelry shops, uh, diamonds, emporiums, those kind of places. And then grade four, which I have never personally actually touched the grade four alarm, basically go on banks. Then within the grades, you have kind of like separate subsections within grades. So first we need to talk about whether you require a graded alarm. Because if a customer is coming to you and saying, oh, I need a professionally installed alarm, they will typically mean graded. So when is there a requirement to have a graded alarm? Well, the answer is, is that's down to your insurance company. Because your insurance company is ultimately the ones that's insuring your property and the belongings within it. And I don't know about all insurance companies, but Tiran, our operations and marketing manager, used to work at Direct Line. And I'm probably going to completely forget all of the things that he told me and just make up a lot of stuff. But I think he said that you only require a graded alarm for Direct Line if you have a premium with a value of £30,000 or greater. 
with at least one valuable with a value of £10,000 or greater. So basically, unless you have something in your house that on its own is worth 10K or more, you don't have a requirement for a graded alarm. If you have a graded alarm and you don't meet those requirements, then all you get is a discount on your premium, which is usually 5%. And we'll have a look in a few minutes about why 5% discount on your premium actually doesn't make sense overall. Then quite often insurance providers will have a requirement on commercial properties for graded alarms, but they need to be the ones to tell you. Now, what's interesting is that several years ago, the law changed that it was not insurers to be the ones to tell you what grade of alarm you needed because trading standards considered that non-competitive. So an insurance provider can tell you that they won't um, insure you, but they can't tell you the specific grade of alarm you, you need. They say that we can't insure you because you have a high requirement, high risk property, you need a grade, you need a graded alarm but then it's actually the responsibility of the, of the alarm installer to do the risk assessment to say what grade you do need. It's just it's a, it makes it a little bit more flexible as well for us because it also means that insurers, especially with the move to things like IoT alarms that you can buy off Amazon, insurers are getting less and less particular about having graded alarms and just more particular about having an alarm in the first place or just having one that is professionally installed. And professionally installed could be any one of you, you're a professional. So what I'm getting at is on a residential property, you're probably looking at maybe one in every 50 of your customers that actually really, really needs a graded alarm. We're talking your customers that have pieces of artwork that's worth a fortune or classic cars that are worth an absolute bomb. They're the people who will need graded. And you also might find that the insurance company places special requirements on where they store those items, and then it's actually the storage place that requires the alarm. So I've done several properties where the insurance company couldn't care less about the house, but the garage where they kept their classic cars, they said you need a grade three alarm on. So we actually put a completely separate alarm in the garage. Then we have commercial. Now, commercial is usually where grading is more of a requirement. You could even have some insurers on shops as small as florists and local, uh, high, uh, and local shops needing graded alarms because they might have cash on premises, they might have goods that are stealable, and therefore they have a high risk. Now, I can't answer again for all commercials, but I can answer for this building that I'm sat in now. So as you all know, we now have a UK warehouse. It's actually directly below on the floor that I am now. Now we do have a Texacom alarm in this property. It was here when we moved in. It will be ripped out when we reconstruct the place. The Texacom actually only covers the office area. It was never actually part, even on the original system, of the area where the warehouse is. So when we built the warehouse, obviously that's a new part of the building. It was all done locks on, including the burglar alarm. We had our insurers round for a survey because we're holding a lot of expensive items. I don't actually want to tell you how much we're holding because I don't want to give anyone any ideas, but you know, we would be considered that kind of jewelry store level of holding of equipment because it's a huge old warehouse. The insurer came round and they did ask us, do you have a graded alarm? And Tyrion answered, no, we do not. We have an ungraded alarm, but it is professionally installed because I did it. And the insurer then asked, OK, does it signal to you or to key holders if there is an alarm event? And we said, well, we don't know whether our version of signaling is the same as yours. So why don't we show you? And of course, we have the caller service on it. So we set off the warehouse and we proved on Tyrion's phone that he got a phone call when the warehouse went off. And the insurer just went, yeah, cool, that's fine, tick. So in our warehouse, the locks on alarm is enough for our insurer, clear as day. Uh, now, Joe has just asked again, why can't the locks on alarm be graded? You obviously weren't paying attention when I had already answered this, Joe, but I will just recap it for you again. It's basically down to two factors. 
The first is that the alarm certification the Euro is actually a European certification for grading. It's very, very old fashioned. And a lot of the features and the requirements in there would actually require us to reduce functionality of our overall system. Doesn't suit us. And secondly, because it could be argued with every upgrade of config that we could be fundamentally changing the way the burger alarm works, we would probably have to get the system recertified with every config release. That's potentially two or three times a year that we have to pay and go through a certification process, which would hold back the config release, cost us extra money. And basically with the small amount of projects that actually require graded, we just decided it wasn't worth the hassle. Cool. And then just to sum up what I've just said, just to prove that I'm not talking absolute nonsense, here is a really nice document that I found around grading. So as you can see here, it goes over grade one, two, three, and four. So you can see grade two, intruders expected to have limited knowledge and tools. Alarm is suitable for low to medium risk. Grade three, expected to have knowledge and full range of tools, medium to high risk. And then grade four, you're never going to do a bank. Uh, here is the section as well that talks about how the, the laws changed so that insurers actually can't dictate which grade you need because it's uncompetitive. That's the job of the alarm provider. The insurance company can solely say that we need you to have a graded or a professionally installed alarm, but they can't say which grade. Then the other interesting thing about grading is that the grading of the system is based around the entire installation. And I think it's mentioned on here. Here we go. So alarm equipment is marked as being suitable for use at a particular grade. So whilst installers will generally use equipment of the same grade in each system, it may sometimes be appropriate to mix equipment of different grades, in which case the official grade of the whole alarm system is that of the lowest graded piece of equipment. So what that means is if you had installed an entire grade three alarm, but the front door was quite old timber and it was warped and the grade three door contact was constantly false alarming, and you swap the front door contact for grade two, the entire alarm is now grade two. So the grading of the alarm is always based on the lowest grade component. And then this is the other caveat as well. The installer is also graded or not graded. So unless you are a member of the NSI or the SSAIB, you are an ungraded installer. And therefore, you could install a grade four intruder alarm, and that intruder alarm is ungraded unless it is certified and provided a certificate by an NSI or SSAIB approved company. So lots and lots of stuff goes into intruder alarms. Then when you have your different grades, you have different signaling grades. These are the subsections within grades. So for a grade two, for example, you can have grade two X, which is also known as bells only. Bells only means that it does not signal to anyone if it goes off. It just makes your outside siren go off. Then you can have grade two monitored. There's different options for monitoring. But basically, with a monitored alarm, it signals through to an alarm receiving company. That alarm receiving company will then take action when your alarm goes off. That could either be phone you as the property owner, or if you have police response, it would be to phone the police. Grade three, there's no bells only option, always has to be monitored. Now, the reason that I was saying that it does not make sense generally to put a graded alarm into a property that doesn't require one is, as I said, you only get a discount on your premium. So what's the average household insurance cost? A couple hundred quid a year? And you get a 5% discount. So you're getting maybe a £10 to £20 discount on your premium. But they typically don't give you a discount if you have a bells only alarm. They typically will only give you a discount if you have a monitored alarm. And even if they do give you a discount with bells only, it still doesn't make financial sense. Because for any graded alarm, it is only graded if you have maintenance on it, even if it's bells only. As soon as you miss your maintenance, it's ungraded. So bells only alarm, 
you can have a single maintenance visit per year. And then any monitored alarm, so that goes through to a receiving center, you have to have two visits per year. Now, again, I can't speak for every alarm company, but the one that I used to work for, I believe it was £95 a year for a Bells only system maintenance and £165 a year for a maintained maintenance. So we're already at the point that at a minimum, we're paying £95 a year to get a £20 discount on our premium. Hmm, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, does it? Then, of course, you might say, oh, well, the customer really wants police monitoring. Above everything else, they want police monitoring so the police go out to their house if the alarm goes off. Fair enough. You need a graded alarm for that. The graded alarm needs to be monitored. It needs to have two forms of monitoring. You need to have two maintenance visits per year. So as well as the maintenance cost, you also need to pay for the monitoring cost, which is usually 150 odd quid for the monitoring company, plus your monitoring solution which for instance on a dual comp is usually about, I think it's about 65 pounds a year. It's, um, it's been a long time, I can't remember it all. Uh, so it's a few hundred quid basically to get police, monitor, uh, police response. Oh, and also you have to play the police as well. It's called a URC and you have to pay them for that luxury as well. Uh, and they will attend twice before they cut off your police response as well. And again, I can't speak for every area, but in Oxfordshire, the average response time for the police was one to two hours. Yeah, everything in your house is gone by then because there's more important things for the police to be dealing with. Now, I believe it's very important for all of you to understand this because you need to ask that question when the customer comes to you and says, I need a graded alarm, I need a monitored alarm, I need a professionally installed alarm. Who made them believe this? If it was an alarm installer that they've spoken to, then there's one big reason the alarm installer wants them to have a, a monitored graded alarm. They're going to get 10 years worth of maintenance contract from them, which is worth a ton. If it was their insurance company, okay, fine. Nothing you can do with that. Or if they just believe it without actually having any knowledge of it, use everything that I've just told you and explain it to them and get them to phone their insurance company, being the only people who can truly tell them if they need a professionally installed graded alarm, yes or no. Then if there is a requirement for a graded alarm, either because the customer just insists on it or the insurance, uh, the insurance company insists, that's where we start talking about integration. Now, as I said, I'm gonna focus on a Texacom because that's the one that I personally have the most experience with. The main option of integration that I'm gonna show you through RS232 I only know about on a Texacom. I cannot tell you if it's possible on any other brand of alarm, you will have to investigate yourself. Typically, alarm companies tend to be pretty closed off or they tend to be still in the 19th century and not understand how technology works. So Texacom, from my experience, is a bit of an exception. I will show you a couple of other methods though that are not as slick, but are possible on most alarm systems that are out there. So let's talk first about the more slick option with a Texcom. So on a Texcom Premier Elite panel, on the panel itself, actually it would have been good if I'd found, I found so many pictures for so many different things, but I haven't actually found a picture for this. Would have been made sense if I did. Ah, let's find a panel picture. This one will do. It shows enough of it. Oh, no, let's go for the exceptionally beautiful pictures of some wired up panels. Yeah, let's see uh, an alarm engineer's work in full glory. <laughs> oh, alarm engineers, love them. Cool. Uh, it's quite hard to see, but that is a Texcom Premier Elite panel. On the Texcom Premier Elite, you have these little white ports you can just about make out here. Those are called COM ports. Now on the smallest Premier Elite panel, I think you've only got one COM port. And then for the ones that I believe, are, I believe the 24 zones and above, you have two COM ports. And then for the bigger panels, you can also actually buy a plug-in module that gives you a third COM port. The COM port is very commonly used by the alarm engineer to commission the system through the Texcom software. 
but they only need one COM port for that. If the alarm company is talking about installing the Texacom, what's it called? Texacom Connect module, that takes up both COM ports. And it's also completely unnecessary because why would you want the Texacom app? You're going to have the locks on app. Tell them to cut that out. They don't need it. Same with the COM IP. Don't need it. Don't want it. Don't want the Texacom app. We want the locks on app. So that then leaves both of these COM ports free. And my recommendation is that you use COM port 2. The reason being is the alarm installer normally, alike, normally likes to use COM port 1 themselves. So you take over COM port 2. And the way that we're going to do this integration is through RS232. So you're going to need the RS232 extension from Loxon. As well as that, so from the Loxon side, you need um, obviously mini server and RS232 extension. In addition to that, from the Texacom side, you need this. This is called the PCCOM lead. So you can see this bit here is the bit that plugs onto that COM port on the Texacom panel. And then this bit is a DB9 9 pin RS232 connector. So that's the Texacom bit that you'll need. It's quite an expensive cable. It's like 25, 30 quid. So make sure you don't do any damage to it. Now, the most important thing about this cable, this is the bit that I see lots and lots of people doing wrong when they integrate a Texacom, is they go, ah, oh, well, there isn't a nine port connector on the RS232 extension. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna chop this end off and I'm just gonna wire this cable straight into the RS232. No, you cannot do that. The COM port is not RS232. This part is TTL. This part, is a TTL to RS-232 converter. If you chop this off, it is no longer RS-232. It will not work. So this cable must remain entirely intact. And the way that I would recommend doing it is to additionally purchase one of these. This is a male DB9 to RJ45 adapter. So this stays in the panel you connect this onto there, and then you pull yourself a cat cable from the Texacom panel to the Loxon panel. Try and keep that cable distance as short as possible. RS-232 does get a bit funny over about 10, 15 meters, so try and keep it as short as possible and try and use a shielded cable. And obviously RJ45 in there, and then the other side you find to just snip off the cat cable and wire in the cores that you need. Then, next bit, that has nine connections on, and the Loxon RS-232 uh, uh, extension has three connections. So how do we turn nine connections into three connections? And that's pretty easy. We actually only need three connections. So here we go. On a DB9 plug, which is what this is, this is a DB9. You obviously have nine pins, and we care about the male, uh, sorry, the female version because the Texcom one is female. And as you can see, here is the pin layout. So we have carrier detect, transmit, receive, ready terminal, ground, data set, clear to send, request to send, ring indicator. The only three we need is TX or transmit, RX or receive, and ground all we care about send receive ground tx rx ground and the funky thing about rs232 is because it's a one-to-one -one connection tx from the plug wires into rx on the 232 extension because send has to go to receive and receive has to go to send they have to cross over so we're looking at pin two for transmit, pin three for receive. And then when you buy this little RJ45 adapter, that then should come with a little pin out. So two I said was send, I believe, did I say? Yeah, so, so two is transmit. So pin two goes to RJ45 pin two. So if you're doing normal wiring, that's uh, orange. Orange would then wire into 
receive on the RS232 extension, because remember, we need to swap it round. And pin three, which is received from the Texacom. Pin three goes to pin one, so that would be white orange. White orange would go to send on the Loxon extension. And then ground is pin five. And pin five goes to, I can't actually make that out because those lines are horrible. I can't quite tell where they're crossing over. It looks like it goes to pin six, which is white, orange, orange, white, green, uh, blue, white, blue, green. So that would be green is then ground. That's nice and easy to remember. Green is ground. Cool. So that's then all of the wiring done. Then we're on to the setup on the Texcom panel and then the setup in Loxon. Setup on the Texacom is fairly straightforward. I'm going to show you in Wintex, which is a Texacom software, because I don't have a keypad that I can easily hold a camera in front of to show you. But basically, and I've got to remember how to do this now as well, because it's been a few years. You have to change COM port 2 to be a good board rate. So board rate is the speed at which it runs. You don't have to change it. You just have to know what it is so that you can set locks on the same. I would normally go for 9,600 or 19,200 as my board rate for COM port 2. And you also need to set COM port 2 to Crestron system. Yes, I know that's a dirty word calling it Crestron, but the communication was originally created for them. So I've reached out to Texcom and they wouldn't get back to me. So Crestron system, COM port two, and that is it from the, uh, from the Texcom side. So COM port two set to Crestron, and make sure you make a note of the board rate. Then we move over to configuration, and we obviously have our RS232 extension. In our RS232 extension, we need to set the correct parameters for it. So that board rate that I just mentioned needs to match what you set on Texcom and everything else is actually correct. So you don't need to change anything else, just board rate. The next thing we need to do is get all of those inputs and outputs from the Texcom into Loxon. So basically we can read uh, oh, actually, somebody's just asked for systems fitted with Texcom Connect. Can we use COM port three instead? The answer is yes, but. So yes, you can use COM port three instead, but the panel doesn't have a COM port three by default. You need to buy it. I think it's called the COM port plus module and you plug it onto the board. So you require an extra bit of hardware, but otherwise, yes. Cool. So next, we need all of the inputs and outputs. So on the Texcom, we can read all of the zone states. We can read the area states. And I think that's it. And then on the outputs, we can send key presses. Ah, well, that's going to be a bit of a ball, like getting them all loaded in there. Never fear. Device templates at the top. And then I'm on the new version of config that was released today. And there is a brand new, absolutely fantastic feature in the new version of config called the locks on library, which is an open library where all of you can put your templates in for all of the things that you've created for everyone to use. And let's take a look. Ta-da! Look at that. Texcom Premier Elite 48 panel. We've got a template for it. Download it. Then back in config, we import a template. We find that file. Go back on. Oh, sorry. There's a little pop up that pops up to say it's been successfully loaded. It's gone onto my other screen. Then we go back to templates. And look at that, Texcom Premier Elite 48. Boom, done. Then we have all of our sensors and our outputs. And from here, we can use them exactly as we see fit. 
Now, even though we can send key presses, I generally would recommend leaving it to the keypad from the Techcom systems to set and unset the alarm. Um, just personal experience, it's RS-232, a packet might be missed, you might miss a key press out, and then you're kind of fuddling around with it, trying to get it to work. I would generally leave it to the keypad. I will, however, try and use the new sequential controller to show you how you might be able to set the alarm through key presses. But the bit we most care about is the sensors. So on the alarm, we have different areas. So neat trick with the Texacom is you always know how many areas are available on the Texacom by the number of zones that are available. So when you buy a Premier Elite, it will be a 24 zone, a 48 zone, a 64, 128, 640. The first block of numbers on the zones is the number of areas it has. So a 24 zone panel has two areas. A 48 zone panel has four areas. A 64 zone panel, six areas. And a 128 zone panel, 12 areas. So you can always know the number of areas you've got by the number of zones on the panel. So this is based around a 48, hence the four areas. Now, generally speaking, you're just going to care about area A unless the alarm has been subdivided. So I'm just going to assume it's a, an alarm covering the whole house. If you want to do like a night set, there is a night set functionality in a Texacom, but we can't read it through RS-232. So instead do the night set as a separate area. So we have area A armed, area A disarmed, for instance. Now, the biggest thing about these zones and all of these sensors is they don't stay on. They are only momentarily sent when the zone or the area first activates. So for instance, if I just go into simulation to show what happens, if I armed area A on the alarm, it won't do this until area A is disarmed because the contact can't be held. So when I arm area A, this will literally just go boop. And when I disarm area A, this one will go boop. So that's it, flash, flash, quick pulses. That's all you're gonna get from the signals. And you have to account for that in your config. So for instance, I would be a personal fan of maybe using a switch block to show me the arm state with the arms going into on and the, disar and the disarm into reset, just because this gives me a option for um, manually overriding if I need to, if for whatever reason a command isn't set. And hey, you know what? Actually, maybe this switch block could be called something else that we use in say auto config, like maybe all out mode, dum, dum, dum. Because what better than your alarm being set and unset to dictate whether you're in the house or not? Then, if you wanted to link it into the locks on burglar alarm so you get all of the additional functionality, ah, just stick a burglar alarm block there. You can use the outputs, Q on and Q off, to arm and disarm it. So Q on and Q off are the uh, edges of the switch block. So when the switch is going on and when the switch is going off, we could use that to arm and disarm that burglar alarm. And then all we need to do is get all of our zones that we're actually using and connect them where they need to go. And that's about it. So whatever zones you're using, connect them on the right input on the burglar alarm block and you're done. And of course, you can also name these zones because you're going to want to know what has actually triggered. So zone one might be our front door contact. Zone 10 might be our hallway PIR. And zone 13 is maybe the lounge PIR. And that's basically it. And then use the burglar alarm exactly as normal. If you want to link any locks on sensors in as well, feel free. And if you have things like switches that you want to click or music that you want to sound, just tick it in here as outputs. Um, I've put 
the arm signal into V, which is arm with a delay, just because I always like to give zones enough time to settle. But of course, you can choose whatever arming delay you want after that. And that's pretty much it. That's RS-232. Now, as I said, I will attempt to show you a way of arming the alarm through locks on as well. I've never tried it this way, so it might not work, but I'll do my best. And I've never used a sequential controller like this, so let's give it a try. First thing on the, on the output is you'll notice that you've only got the key presses zero to nine. And depending on how the alarm is set up, you might also need to send the Y for the yes, the N for the no, and maybe even the R for the reset as well, depending on how the alarm's set up. Nice thing is it's actually dead simple to do that. The commands for the Y for the yes key is Y, so it's key Y. For the no key, it's key N. And for the reset key, it's key R. So it's still quite easy. So if you wanted to, you can actually just add some extra actuators. That would be yes key. Command for on would be key Y. Another one for the no key. And command for on would be key N. Nice and simple. Then let's give it a try with a new sequential controller. And I'll probably get a completely fail at this point because I have used the sequential controller, um, but I used it actually on a lot more complex thing. But I think that the fact that this is simple might actually uh, knock me. So first of all, sequential controller, basically you create a list of things that you want to happen. So we could do, first of all, Uh, start sequence, set pulse. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, I should just be able to start straight of all. When the sequence goes, I think I can just go, if we do like a four digit code, I'm going to have to do four outputs plus the Y key. So the first thing I'd want to do is take the four keys that I'm using for my code. So let's say my code is really secure and it's one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four. And then I need the Y key, the yes key. And then I think on the sequential controller, I can just put the rules in as AQ1 equals one. What have I done wrong? So I've already made a mistake. Lines must begin with a valid command. OK. So I probably need to start with a, yeah, probably need to start with an if rule. So if just means if this happens, start the chain. So if, let's say, AI1 equals 1, we want to make AQ1 equal one. Done it again, what am I doing now? What am I doing wrong now? Ah, set. There we go. Set AQ1 to one, set AQ2 to one. Uh, thank you, Adrian, thank you, Tiran. How does our marketing manager know how to use the sequential controller more than I do? AQ3 to 1, AQ4 to 1, and AQ5 to 1. Something along those lines, in theory, should work. OK. And then we just need something in AI1 to say that we want to set the alarm. So maybe in this scenario, our burglar alarm block doesn't have the alarm into VNR to tell it to arm, but instead we are using this burglar alarm block to trigger this. So we could use maybe AQR, which is the remaining time of the arming delay into AI1. 
that would mean I'd actually need to change this sequential controller to if AI1 is greater than zero. And then we also need to actually set sequence one running. So again, maybe just AQR into set sequence one because that's uh, digital input. So anything above zero will set it off. Uh, then that should work. Let's give it a try. So I'm just gonna, for testing purposes, put a input. I'm gonna call this alarm test. And I'm just going to put that into V, which is the set input, go into simulation and see whether this works. Cross fingers. Oh, look at that. Oh, that is beautiful. It worked. Now, you can see that they all went on one after another. The great thing about this is that you can actually set how long that interval is on the sequential controller. And you need to give it enough time for each of those commands to be recognized on the intruder alarm before putting the next one in. So you might find that you actually need maybe an 800 millisecond um, one instead. And then what I would say we need to do as well, I would say the last thing we need to do is just add an extra line into the sequential controller to reset it when the alarm has set. So probably then take AQ into R so that when it does finally reset, it can reset the whole lot. Would the set pulse command be better to use? Yes, Andy, it absolutely would. <sighs> oh, everyone knows this block better than I do. Oh dear, this is not gonna look good. I hope none of, I hope none of the uh, managers of Loxon are watching this. Um, but yes, Andy, you are correct that set pulse would be better because it would then only pulse these outputs rather than actually uh, latching them. Cool thing about the sequential block is you actually can also start simulation inside the block. And then when you do that, if we start triggering it again, you can actually see it rolling through the lines as it goes. And yes, Andy, you were absolutely correct. Set pulse was much better because it then it only pulsed each one. And when this time runs out and the alarm actually sets itself, it will reset the sequential controller waiting to roll again. Uh, so that's AQR uh, is what's setting this to send an arm signal. And then I would also need to have something from the alarm block when I want to disarm it that would send a sequence of events through again on sequence one to send the disarm code. Uh, I would probably do that again from the all out switch in a real life scenario. I'd probably use Q on, Q off. But just to show you, there we go. It's, oh, it's finished the simulation. I think that's triggered reset. Yeah, that went on in there. So sequential controller then reset. Beautiful. So sequential controller looks like it worked for setting and unsetting your intruder alarm just a little bit of fiddling around for what goes in your sequences to start them and then what resets the block. But that's RS-232 in a nutshell. Nothing really more or less than you need. You could of course also, under add function blocks, let's say we had a lighting controller as well. There's nothing inherently stopping you from using these sensors as inputs into maybe MV or P on the lighting controller as well, to use them in place of a Loxon sensor. Now that again, obviously comes with a caveat that alarm detectors are designed to detect intrusion, not presence. If you are sat down for a long period of time, it may stop picking you up or actually it may just not pick you up at all unless you start waving your hands around again. So just bear that in mind and don't make it a default. Make it a nice to have rather than a core consideration. But in principle, there's nothing stopping you doing that. Right, so RS-232 integration is done. It's, I know I've gone over quite a lot. It's not that complicated. Don't worry about it. It's quite simplistic really once you get your head around it. Once you've got the wiring done, the rest comes later. The other way of integrating an alarm, so I'm just gonna rename this page RS-232. The other way of integrating alarm is much more simplistic 
and it will work across a much wider range of alarm systems. The first is how do we set and unset an intruder alarm where we don't have some fancy RS-232 integration? And the answer is, on most alarm systems, you have an option called either momentary key or latch key. Texcom has this. If I'm on their software and I go onto zones and I just find an unused zone, you'll see zone type, as well as being able to set it as an alarm zone, I also have these two options of moment key and latch key. Now they're quite cool. What that means, if you're on latch key, you wire a locks on relay into this zone on the panel. When the relay is closed, the alarm is armed. When the relay is open, the alarm is disarmed. So actually by wiring into a zone on the panel from a relay and locks on, you can arm and disarm the alarm through latch key. You can even, after you set it, select which areas you arm. So if you have multiple free inputs on the board, you can actually arm different areas of your alarm through different locks on relays. And then a moment key by comparison. So latch key is when relay shut, um, alarm, uh, alarm arms, that's a complicated thing to say. When relay open, alarm disarmed. A moment key means a pulse. Every pulse will either arm or disarm depending on the current state it's in. So if it's armed and you pulse, it will disarm. If you pulse again, it will rearm. Really, really handy option. So arming and disarming through that means really good. Then for the monitoring of your alarm on what's going on, Texacom panels, as with most other panels, have outputs available on them. So a Texacom, for instance, on your main panel, you have two panel outputs. And then on your network, where your expanders are, you've got even more outputs. So you will at minimum have two outputs. And then if you've got expanders, they'll have even more. And these outputs differs between alarm systems, but on a Texacom, for example, you can make that output do just about anything you want. So you could, for instance, make this output trigger if area A goes into alarm. You could make this output trigger if area A is armed, so full armed. You can even make an output mimic a zone. So you can even know what zones have gone off through these outputs. You'd obviously need a lot of them. So that can then be really handy for you then recognizing when your alarm is actually active. And you would then wire those outputs from your alarm into inputs in Loxon. The only thing to know about those outputs is that they are ground signals, not positive voltage signals. So they're open collector outputs. This does mean that to have them working inside Loxon, you have to add a 4.7 kilo ohm resistor through 24 volts to the panel output so that you can recognize it on the digital input, because obviously we recognize the voltage applied. So it's still possible, but it just means the addition of a resistor. Or finally, again, on a Texacom specifically, they have an add-on module called the RM8 module, the relay module eight, which plugs onto the board and gives you volt-free relays eight of them. And these fault-free relays, you can configure to be whatever you want. So you add it to the network, or actually rather, I think you add it to one of these options. I think you might add it to the X10, uh, and it takes over from them. And then those trigger the volt-free relays. And obviously those volt-free relays, you could put 24 volt into the common, and then the normally open, you feed into a digital input. Bish, bash, bosh job done. So two different ways of alarm integration, RS-232 and through relays and inputs. The relays and inputs version will work on most professional alarm systems. The RS-232 version, I have only personally tested it on Texacom. 
Whew. I know I actually didn't show any config for that, but it's pretty obvious. You have inputs for your either areas or your zones, and you have outputs for setting and unsetting. And otherwise, it worked pretty much just like this. Perfect. Has anyone got any questions for me? That was a lot of stuff to go through. OK, so Andy has asked on the sequential controller, can you change the uh, length of the pulse on the set pulse command? And the answer is no. There's no documentation there for how to do it. So I am assuming it will either be however long you've set the interval, or it will be one processor interaction of the mini server. Um, but I think I would need to actually have a real life working system to properly test that out. Adrian has asked if there's IP integration available with Texacom. So Texacom do have a module called the Com IP. Well, actually, they have two IP modules. They have the Com IP and the Texacom Connect. Texacom Connect, no, nada, nothing. I've looked at it. The API is very complex. We wouldn't be able to do it through virtual outputs and virtual inputs. The Com IP, the answer is eh. so. You can actually set the Com IP module to be uh, to be uh, the ASCII pass through, which then means it's Telnet. Uh, and when it's set like that, you can actually use virtual outputs to send the key presses. It's exactly the same commands as it is on RS232, but you do it through virtual outputs instead. And I have personally tested that and it worked. The problem is that we can't read data from the panel over the COM IP because it's constantly sending the sensor and area signals as telnet packages. And there is no way to hold a connection over IP to a device with config. So on the virtual inputs, the only option we have for external services is an HTTP input, which basically polls a website every X amount of seconds. The problem is, unless the alarm panel happens to be sending the signal at exactly that polling cycle time, we're not going to see it. So the answer, honestly, Adrian, is without a hell of a lot of faff in, no. But... This lead costs 25 quid and the COM IP module costs like 120. I suppose you're saving the cost of the RS-232 extension, but there's not really a cost difference to it. Okay, Hugh, how would you set up multiple areas in order to show a night set mode? Also, what is actually displayed in the Loxon user app with RS-232 integration? So for doing things like night set, easy. When the alarm is set up, you set up different areas. So we've actually got two areas on our alarm panel. We've got one for the main office and one for the warehouse. So in your house, you would have whole house as area A, and then area B would be night set. Then in locks on, you just make sure that you create two burglar alarm blocks, one for the whole house, one for the night set, and you drag out the relevant sensors. So you would obviously only want to pay attention to the area A for the whole set and the area B for the part set. And then the zones are the zones of the zones. As to what it shows in the app, absolutely nothing different to the locks on burglar alarm. Because remember, the customer in the app doesn't see inputs and outputs. The customer sees function blocks and they're seeing the burglar alarm block. No different to if it was the locks on burglar alarm. In fact, easiest way to show you is if I open up our office. So office and alarm, here we go. Warehouse alarm, building alarm. So the warehouse alarm is locks on only, so that is a Honest to goodness, locks on alarm, nothing added, nothing taken away. Locks on present sensors, the whole lot. You can see it's armed and you can see our message history. We've delayed arm it, we've disarmed it, blah, 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 blah. And we can see probably, well, hopefully, it hasn't gone off in its history, which it hasn't. Wonderful. 
The building alarm is this one here, and that's on Texacom. And notice how it doesn't look any different. Message history also should look exactly the same. And these triggers here that you can see are the Texacom sensors. They are the zones, these things here from the Texacom alarm. And all I've done is name them where they are. So simple as that. The customer could theoretically arm and disarm the burglar alarm through the locks on app, but they then might get out of sync with what the actual alarm is doing. So whatever you set up, make sure the customer knows how to actually um, deal with it. Uh, Chris has asked if I could drop that document that I showed you about the different grades somewhere. And the answer is yes, sure. I will put it, oh no, I'll just close down my web browser. Oh no, it's gone. Once I find it again, oh, it's here, restore. Uh, I will put it on the Academy Ocean because that's where we put everything. So everything, including this webinar, once complete, will be on the Loxon Academy. Awesome. Any other questions? Uh, no other questions? No, nobody? Doesn't have to be about what we've covered. There has been a config release today, so feel free to ask about that as well if you're interested. But no questions is brilliant. So what I will do, just if I am waiting for any more questions to come through, I will send over the poll for what we should cover next time. And I have been a little bit naughty. I haven't adjusted the poll. So we have actually already covered project planning and security deep dive. So please make sure you don't choose one of those two options because I'm not going to cover something we've already covered. But if you could all please select what you'd like to cover next time. Cool. And in the meantime, while I'm waiting for those responses to come through, feel free to stick over any questions. Uh, when will the one wire extensions come into stock? Like you expect me to know stock levels and stock arrival times for every single product off the top of my head. Oh, let me have a look. So on webinar, sorry, not on webinar, on newsletter, you should have received a link to this that uh, tells you all of stock levels. So one wire extension, that's the one wire temperature set. I don't see it on here. Tiran, if you are on here, uh, one wire extension, I think is showing out of stock in the shop, but is not on this list. Tiran's the man for that, he'll check. Will I be covering commercial fire alarm integration soon? Potentially, as soon as I have a commercial fire alarm that I can integrate into. Um, so the one in our office is quite old and dated. Now we have actually already integrated into it, but all we're doing is we're taking a panel output. Um, I can tell you now, it's quite easy. Uh, so the fire alarm that we have in our office, uh, there's no RS-232 or 485 on it, it's very basic, but it does have a panel output. Now the fire alarm itself is also 24 volt DC. So what I'm doing is I've got a nano IO just mounted in the fire alarm panel, powered by the power, uh, fire alarm panel. And then we're just using the panel output wired into an input on the nano IO. And we've just got that into the fire alarm blocking locks on. Dead simple. Uh, for anything more complex than that, the answer is I will need to have a real alarm I can test with. How did I get the recommended templates for automatic download? So from the new version of config that was released this morning, we have introduced something called the Loxon library. So in config now, when you go to device templates at the top, for anything that you can have templates, so IP, so virtual outputs, virtual inputs, RS-232, 485, IR, Modbus, device templates at the top, 
you have an option to search Locks on Library online. And this is an open community where Locks on partners, Locks on staff, everyone can upload any templates they have. So please, if you've got templates and you are, want to share them with the world, throw them in there. You can see we're actually already at a good 160 odd templates. So we're doing well. And that is within, I think, a couple of weeks of it being in beta and one day of release. So this will be a great library for all partners. Are there any plans to cover integration with motorized Velux windows? Um, not currently, because I'm hoping that at a point not too far away in the future, I won't have to go into a great amount of detail on how to integrate with it, and it'll be fairly simple. So I don't want to do a job twice. So we will wait and see. Uh, one more extension is in stock. Tyrion has just let me know. Are there any plans to offer integration with car chargers other than Kiba? You already can. Um, so our car chargers at our office are Rolex. And our integration is a contactor and an energy meter. It's all you need for a car charger, contactor and energy meter. Turn it on and off and read what it's pulling. And that's integration. Um, other than that, like actual IP integration, I don't know. We have reached out to, I think Cameron reached out to My Energy um, for their car charger, but it's like signing an NDA and never disclosing what their API looks like. So if we can actually put it into config, I don't know. And does the Fronius integration work for other manufacturers who follow the SunSpec standard? Not a clue, I'm afraid. But when it comes to solar PV, take a look at the library. Because, I mean, I don't know who the other SunSpec manufacturers are, but if we take a look at the energy category, let's take a look what's already in here. So we've got Fronius. We've got Huawei. We've got Costal. We've got Fuji. We have also got... Da, 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 now, I know we have it, but I don't know where it is. I don't know why it's not under the energy category. We also have Solar Edge in there as well. So you might actually find that we already have a template for the particular inverter you're looking for. And there it is, Solar Edge as well. So with just doing alarms, would there be enough content for doing the like of drive gate slash garage and doors integration? Uh, well, I've already done one on access control. Um, so it would kind of be like redoing a topic that's already been done. Um, garages and gates are something I haven't done. I could look at it, but to be honest, they're really simple. If you've got a half decent garage or gate, there's just a dry contact or a 24 volt app applied contact on the gate or garage board that you just need to wire into a relay and that triggers it to open close. Uh, Tyrion has also reminded us that we now have Tesla Powerwall 2 integration in locks on from the latest release. So if you've got a Tesla Powerwall, plug it into the network and boosh, you got it on locks on. Do I have a date for Spotify Connect to be working? No, I'm afraid not. Um, the development team, they, they let us know what they're working on, or sometimes they let us know what they're working on, but they don't give dates because a date is a promise we can't necessarily keep. So all I can tell you is that it is on the radar. Uh, can you configure the intercom to call specific users? The new intercom, I take it. The answer is yes. You have to have something whereby you can say which user you want to call because the intercom itself only has a single button. So you will need something like the NFC code touch to be able to do your bell indication. But yes, there is a way around it. There is a way to do it. Um, until I have a real life intercom to test though, I wouldn't be able to do something like a webinar on it. All right, perfect. That was lots of questions. I love questions. Is there a shipment date yet for the new intercom? So they are starting to arrive in Austria 
Uh, we will hopefully have our first shipment of them. Uh, at this moment in time, I'm just going to say next month because it, it is hopefully the middle of next month. But this month's consignment was delayed by a week because of guess what? HGV driver shortages. Um, so ah, spreadsheet's been updated. Thank you, Tiran. So Tiran has just let me know that the spreadsheet that I just showed you a second ago has been updated. Uh, you'll be able to see it on there. But basically, they're starting to roll in in the warehouse. So they will start to go out over the next few weeks. All righty. I think that was all of the questions. Just going to go through them all, make sure that I've answered them all. And if you do have any in the meantime, feel free. Daryl, see you later. Have a look at Hypervolt. <laughs> okay, I will. I will have a look at Hypervolt. Uh, Solar Edge, My Energy, Locks on Intercom. Do, 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 do. Dave. Uh, the answer is honestly speak to your locks on partner. Uh, sorry, speak to your locks on partner coach because they will be able to walk you through the exact requirements. But the partner search map is not a it's not a given. You have to meet a set of criteria to appear on it. Um, in a nutshell, silver partner and above. One completed project per year, and that just means an installed mini server. And you have to have a website that talks about Loxon being your preferred automation choice with a Loxon logo that has a link back to our website. Uh, if you have those criteria met, speak to your partner coach. They can check it out with you and get you on the map. But for, for, for us, we want to make sure that the map is always a go-to resource for a customer that they know that if they're seeing someone on there that they have a website, they look professional and basically they'll get in touch with the customer. Okay, right. Thank you very much, guys. It has been an absolute pleasure. Chat to you again soon. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye.